start now and introduce our first speakers. Uh, we've got Dr. Kim and Dr. Quinty from Massachusetts General Hospital in Charleston, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, that's associated with Harvard Medical School. And Dr. Kim and Quinty, uh, the project that they're doing is called the impact of antimalarial drugs on amyloid beta-induced tau pathology in human urine. I was really interested in this one because I go to malaria endemic countries often, and so it's pretty neat to think that maybe we could prevent Alzheimer's with an anti-malaria. <laughs> so that was exciting. But they are recipients of our Roger Ackerman Memorial Award. Award We consider this our top research award. Uh, they are awarded a $300,000 grant. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Kim. So he is an associate professor of neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He received his education at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology back in 1998. He did his postgraduate work at the Brain Disease Research Center at Aju University in South Korea. And then finally, he ended up at Massachusetts General Hospital in the Genetics and Aging Research Unit. He has been investigating pathogenic mechanisms for Alzheimer's disease for the past 20 years. He's got a lot of experience in this field. The thing that's unique about him is he pioneered the development of a 3D human neural cell culture model for AD that is often called the Alzheimer's in a dish model. It was listed as for the 10 breakthrough technologies in 2015 by the MIT Technology Review. So uh, amazing development there. He's been awarded the Smithsonian American Ingenuity Award, the Partners Innovation Discovery Award, and the John Douglas French Alzheimer's Foundation Award. So I hope you can see he's a very talented researcher. We're blessed to have him as a CART recipient. Uh, he's working with uh, Dr. Luis e. Quinty. Uh, they'll both be presenting today. Dr. Quinney is an instructor in the Department of Neurology, uh, also working at Massachusetts General Hospital. She did her undergraduate work at the University of Pavia and then got a PhD in chemistry from Massachusetts Metropolitan University in the United Kingdom. She also did her postdoctoral fellowship work at Massachusetts General Hospital. She's been very actively involved in the uh, development of therapeutics for neurodegenerative diseases. She's working on projects that focus on neuroprotection and prevention of neuroinflammation. And so she has said in her bio to me that she's very passionate about developing reliable in vitro models for Alzheimer's disease that can identify new drug targets and accelerate uh, the fund for, for a cure for this. So we are so pleased to have Dr. Quinty and uh, Dr. Kim with us today. Dr. Kim, I believe you're going first. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your invitation and it's a great honor to be here and present our work to your support and all the nice, the kind comments for our work. So we actually working on Alzheimer's disease in the Boston and Massachusetts General Hospital. And our goal is find the cure for this terrible disease out of these huge numbers of Alzheimer's patients everywhere. So we are hoping that our work found a way, the paved the way to find real cures for the Alzheimer's patient who really suffering it, not like before getting it, <laughs> right? So, okay, so go to the next. Okay, I can start with a little bit more provocative <laughs> ideas. So we know very well that there are standard drug testing model is Alzheimer's mouse models. So we have genetically engineered mice that develop Alzheimer's in six to 12 months. And every trial drug candidates needs to pass through this mouse testing. So if you can fix Alzheimer's in the mice and then you can test it in the human. So we fix Alzheimer's more than hundred times in the mouse. So mouse are happy because we can have a cure for mice. But the problem is that most of them has been failed. So this is where we started. Is it really something wrong with this process? Is it really true that something treat Alzheimer mice, which mice do not have Alzheimer in normal conditions? It's genetically manipulated. So is it true that it is really going forward 
Is there any other models we can rely on? That's where we started human cellular models that we believe is more closely recapitulate what's happening in Alzheimer's patient brains. So I think uh, you see this a lot, a little bit complicated, but this is like a basis for many of Alzheimer research and also drug development. So this is so-called beta amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is originated from Dr. Tanji Mai Big Boss and Dennis Selko and other the prominent Alzheimer researchers. And this is very simple hypothesis in the sense. So you are getting something called beta amyloid peptide accumulates in your brain, either by genetics or by clearance problem. And they become a aggregate and they make amyloid plaques. That's one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's. Then this, this is very simple hypothesis. Oh, sorry. The, this is actually this excess accumulation of beta amyloid is driving those vicious cascades that triggers neuronal death and we still call it, oh. Uh, yeah, so, neuro, so this is a tangle. So we are saying that amyloid induces this neurofibrillate tangled pathways. These tangles are, are inside, inside the human inside. neurons and these proteins is normally working in the cytoskeletal system. But when amyloid accumulates in the brain, this become a, another aggregates and make neurons sick. And that's a, a, a so-called amyloid cascade hypothesis. Amyloid deposition leads to tangles and neurodegeneration. Very simple. The problem is that mouse model failed to recapture this. So if you say mouse model of Alzheimer's, they have a plux, they have inflammation, cognitive deficit, no tangles, no neurodegeneration. So something's missing there. <laughs> so it's not like human brain again. So that's where we studied human cellular models that can be calculated more closely to Alzheimer's pathologies. And this was actually a story of really big failure it becomes into new findings. Because when we first started there, we generate beautiful human brain cells in a dish. And that expresses almost high level as compared to level of amyloid beta peptide like human patient brains. It's all great. But if you are looking at this, this is so-called petri dish. We are growing cells and cells growing in the bottom of the dishes. And we grow them. The young Ken Kim was first author of that work. And she grows six week, 12 week, very long time. And she confirmed that, okay, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, amyloid here. But what we see is out of those 12 weeks, even longer, no plaques, no tangles, they're happy. <laughs> so they see very big questions like maybe hypothesis is wrong. It's not really toxic as it is. So she was very depressed at the time. And she came to me and said that maybe she needs to quit and go back to Korea. So, <laughs> But what we see is it may be the system problem, not itself. Because when you grow the cells in a dish in the 2D, we are changing changing liquid media nutrient every two days. So what we do is that there are a beta peptide secreted into the media and we wash it away. So we actually clean it up every two days. So in brains, amyloid beta peptide accumulates and making a plus tangles. But here we are actually making cells clean up <laughs> every two days. And that's what we realize because we are keep doing it. So we actually come up with the idea. What if we are making a gels? for the support for these aggregates. So we are growing the gel. Gels not only make the neurons and brain cells in three-dimensional spaces, but we are mimicking brain conditions where amyloid accumulates and aggregates. That's where we started. And I can make it a little bit faster here. This is a six months differentiated cells. You can see the, this whole thing. But this is probably the one of the things appeared in many news media. So this red, is the first amyloid plaques recapitulated in a dish model. So you can see that these red amyloid, these G sections is generated over here. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, so, and then tangles, this is one of our big surprise and very happy because mouse model cannot make amyloid in these tangles. That was I showed you, but in the human model, what you see, 
we see very robust tangles in the dish again. So you see these, the, the, these popular colors are the neurons with these aggregated tau proteins accumulate and start killing. They look not normal, right? So, and then what you see EM, there's a structure of tangle. So great, I'll make it faster here. This is not published yet, but this is one of the pictures, tank plaques and tangles in a dish. You can see that the red plaques and purple tangles, and they are together. So in a dish, we can actually was able to recapture amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles, which is not possible with Alzheimer's mass model. So we are very excited about this model. Maybe this is the model to check new drugs going forward, because we know very well that mouse model would not do this. And then we are missing these big parts. So I'm not gonna go through it, but we are keep going on because my laboratory, I'm switching to Louisa. So we are more interested in regenerating our brain in a dish. It's not only, this is just start. We make a microglia, neuroinflammatory changes in a dish. We generate even the, the T cells interactions and we have blood brain barrier, but that can be explained later. So we just say there's many uh, models we are keep developing in line of severe culture. We have a uh, world, the top experts in every single neurodegenerative disease. We have ARS, we have Huntington's, we have Parkinson's. Every floor, we can just go and talk to them. And what I knew about Louisa is that she's working on Huntington's disease and she's working using cellular model to screen drugs. So I was thinking maybe Louisa is the right person to ask. Maybe we can get drug screen system out of this model. So my presentation will be a little bit more technical. So if you guys have any question after, feel free to ask me. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of what we are doing, how we identify these molecules and also what we are gonna be using the grant fund to do after. So, are you still? so we were telling you before about this brain in a dish model and to develop a new drug from start all the way to the patients is a very expensive as well as, a, as, well as lengthy process. So nowadays the idea is what about if we repurpose a drug which is already in use? So there are about 1,700 FDA approved drugs that we can test to see if they can be useful for Alzheimer's disease, but in which model? So if we do it in mice, as you can see here in the first one, it will take us about eight mice per drug, and therefore it will cost us about $150 per drug. And uh, we need 3,400 mice to test the old 1,700 FDA approved drugs. It would be a huge facility that has the opportunity to all do this because also time-wise it will take between 24 and 48 months. Then there is a newer model which is brain organoids. This is a tissue model where the old tissue is grown in a dish. So it has a high complexity. We will only be needing one organoid per compound. However, we'll be needing 1,700 organoids that are extremely expensive to grow, and also the failure rate is pretty high. So the total cost for the full library would be about $250,000. What about if we use our brain in a dish model and we select four replicates for each compound? We do that in dishes which have 96 holes, let's say, therefore we need 90 of them. The cost per drug is $5 and we can complete the project in six, week, in six months and the total cost is less than $10,000. Of course, going from mice to our model, we are reducing cost, we are reducing time, we are also reducing complexity because we have a model, not a full organism like a mouse that we're using. But we're also increasing reproducibility because for wells in a dish are a lot more similar than four mice running in a cage. So, um, okay. So instead of using, uh, looking for FDA approved drugs, we decided to have a different approach. How about we look for natural products? So we purchased the library, which is a collection of natural products from Selechem which consists of 803 compounds. 
these have a known activity because they're not a mixture of reagent, they're a single reagent. The activities are shown in these uh, graphs mostly have a an, an miscellaneous activity but known, and the others group up as involved in metabolism, involved in neuroinflammation, and so on. And there are several advantages of using natural products versus synthetic drugs, because typically a natural products will be less toxic, it will hit more than one target, However, it will be most, more costly to actually extract from the plant. So there are pros and cons of going for a natural product versus a synthetic drug. So this is how we do it in our model, uh, the brain in a dish. We grow the cells uh, in a flask, uh, then we move them into plates and we let the pathology of Alzheimer's disease develop for three weeks. And then we start treating with the drugs for another three weeks. So we complete one treatment in six weeks. And during these six weeks, we can monitor how the cells are doing, if the pathology is getting developed, as well as how the drugs are doing. Are they killing all our neurons? What are they doing with our astrocytes? And we do that via microscopy, as well as by our other biochemical methods. And at the end of the six weeks, we can analyze the media, which is the part where the molecules will be in solution in the uh, red, the orange part. And then we can analyze the gel where the amyloid beta and the Dow proteins are trapped. And we can do that in different methods. In the panel A, we use uh, ELISA, which is, a, which is a more quantitative method when we measure the difference between different proteins. For Alzheimer's disease, we are always interested in tau proteins and amyloid beta proteins. And then we can do it by microscopy. So the panel B that you see down is where we visualize the same proteins looking at, uh, by microscopy. So we started with our 803 product and in the, our model with the help of a Cure Alzheimer Fund that funded us in develop this uh, drug screening process. And then we found 102 natural products that actually were lowering phosphotau, which is a toxic protein Alzheimer's disease. But these are called primary hits. So a lot of them are false hits. They will not reconfirm once we test them again. And out of these 102, let's say 12 are what we consider strong hits. And you can see them here. When we started looking at what these compounds were, we found that uh, two of them belong to the anti-malaria group of drugs. Uh, they are boxed in red. One is RT ether, and the other one is dihydroartemisinin. So this is an interesting group of drugs. The first one was identified in 1972 by Professor Yu Yu. She got the Nobel Prize for this uh, project in 2015. It's out of a plant called Artemisia annua, from which the name uh, Artemisinin. And they, they are similar with uh, other, all similar with each other chemically. So the second one is dihydroartemisinin, which is uh, um, the active metabolites of all of them. So they will all break down on the drug that you see with DHA. And then there is artesonate, which is actually FDA approved in the United States for use, while the others are approved in other countries, but not the United States. And then there is artemeter, and then there is RT eater. And uh, uh, all of them have uh, a similar uh, peculiar uh, chemical uh, structure, which is the two oxygen uh, circled in red and is called an endoperoxide bridge. And the mechanism of these drugs is not known, but it's thought that this endoperoxide bridge is involved in how they work. So we tested them in our system. And in black, it's the testing where we look at what they do with the reduction of phosphorylated tau, which is a toxic protein in Alzheimer's disease. And all of them reduce phosphotau. That's what we want, actually, it's phosphotau over tau. And then in red uh, we, and in purple, we see what they do with amyloid beta protein in the gel. And surprising to what we thought, they are all increasing amyloid beta. So we looked at 
is this, can we modulate this effect in another system? So we did a simple in vitro aggregation assay where we add the drugs together with amyloid, the amyloid protein and we see them aggregating over time. So in the panel on the left, we have our drugs. There is the MSO, which is our control in blue, and that would be the natural aggregation of the amyloid beta protein. And then we, in the presence of the drug, which are all the other curves, this process is increased. And that is a 10 micromolar drug treatment. Then in the next panel, which is the same, the 100 micromolar treatment, which means that there is a dose response effect. So more drugs we add, more this effect happens. And it is shown at the end for one of the drugs, which is our teeter. And uh, also, we, as I said, these two oxygen in the structure of the anti-malaria drug um, can play a role. So we bought another compound, which is not an anti-malaria drug, which is 2 deoxy artemisinin which does not have these uh, two oxygen bridge, only has one of them. And when we added in the solution, we saw that the effect of the increase uh, in the aggregation was nearly eliminated because the red curve nearly overlaps with the blue curve when there is no drug. While in the presence of the anti-malaria drug in the black curve, there is an increase of the aggregation. So we actually provide the proposing very provocative hypothesis. As you know that we're most of Alzheimer drugs is trying to reduce these A beta levels and aggregates. What we are proposing here, this particular drug is actually reducing tau and pathos by enhancing A beta aggregation. And this is quite a crazy idea for many people, but as you know, in Alzheimer experts knows very well, it's not A beta aggregates. The soluble intermediate forms are toxic forms. A beta aggregates is not connected with cognitive decline in the patient. And they are even, re re the thought is a protective mechanism. So what we are trying to do is reducing this. And based on these evidences, we think it's possible that these anti malarial chemicals are actually accelerating these soluble pathogenic species into big aggregates. So basically what we do is that these anti malaria drug is supposed to interact with the box, the malaria box and killing them. We're saying the same chemical mechanism is happening with A beta oligomers. And instead of killing them, they are just aggregates in the non-toxic forms. So it's very provocative hypothesis. That's why we need the support because the, what we think is that this is really exciting new drugs, but as you know, it's not gonna be easy to prove. A lot of evidence will be presented, but I think in that way, we can actually provide new way of mechanistic the thing. So I'm gonna just not gonna go through details, but this is two goals we have. We still hope this drug can be useful for the patient in the end. But at this moment, as you know, that it may enhance amyloid plaque. So you don't want to take it right away. But if the mechanistic idea is proven, then this drug can be used for the patients that a little bit different way of thinking. So we are actually doing a lot of the human cellular and mechanistic studies to prove enough proof of concept idea for the final trial. That's what we hope to do that. And another thing is this is idea, everybody wants to knock down with this amyloid. But the, our, the, one of the idea is Ram Moyer who died, passed away two years ago. And he believed that amyloid is not an enemy. They are really antimicrobial peptide protecting brain from the infections. Like say that there might be a role. So instead of just killing it, we can make it its opposite. But it may not sound like natural what others say, but this is actually a great thing about private funding like you guys support us, and then we can provide something new, not exactly the same thing we've been hearing. So, and this is final slide and just to show you something. So I already told you that this is conventional way of drug screening. We have uh, some models, chemicals and test mouse and put a human. And as you know, there's a lot of failures after that. And our model can be also helpful that way, but we are hoping that we can actually skip these mouse models because I see too many times these drugs, really brilliant drugs by my colleague just fail because it's not working in the mice, but we are actually targeting human, not mice. So what we propose is that if you're working with safe 
drugs like FDA approved or natural product which has been using hundreds of years with a human. And those can be directly tested for the risk in the human and then, then might accelerate drug discovery. So that's our take home message today. So finally, I'd like to thank that the uh, Jane Kroshev and she's doing a lot of those drug screening work and Will Linus and he's also working on anti-malaria drugs and also Dr. Luke Tanji who was a big supporter of this whole project and without his support uh, we never make these drug screen team across the group. Finally I'd like to say thank to the, our unit members this is all unit members of the many PIs and all dedicated to working on Alzheimer's disease and uh, I also want to mention that Dr. Seon Choi was the last year recipient. You cannot find him somewhere here, <laughs> it's hard, but he was there and then he's working on the regeneration. So we joke around that if we fix Alzheimer's and then he can make them neurons grow. <laughs> that's why he's working on it. So that's it. And we really the appreciate funders and especially your support was big part of this project. Thank you very much.